Hi, everyone. It's Danielle Karapkin speaking to you from Thornhill, Ontario for webyeshiva.org. We are studying Morin of uh, We are getting very close. We are in the last three chapters of section two of the guide. Uh, and uh, we are talking about prophecy, the prophetic experience. Uh, for the Rambam, this is a very important idea, as we've discussed several times. So what we want to do, uh, our goal is after the Rambam has defined all the different levels of prophecy, the Rambam is going to drive home to us um, that the experience of prophecy can sometimes be as vivid as the experiences that we're having in the real world. You know, um, now with all of the discussions of uh, virtual reality, it should not be d uh, surprising that it's possible to have a purely epistemological experience, meaning an experience that is purely in the mind, but which seems to be something which is um, uh, completely experiential on the outside world on a physical plane. And we've talked about this idea before, you, talking about the, the highest degree of prophecy underneath Moshe Rabbeinu's, which is the mar'ah, the, um, the ability to have this visionary, vivid imagination experience, imaginary experience, which seems real in so many different ways. Um, but what the Rambam is going to follow through with on this is that there are many passages throughout Tanakh which are somewhat ambiguous in that they describe a vision, but then they describe an action which appears to be taking place on the physical plane in the outside world, in the real, what we would call, so to speak, the real world, although it's not what, you know, it's not the real world because the real world is where Hashem is, but uh, in the physical world. Um, and what the Rambam's thesis is, and it's quite radical and a departure from what we would consider to be conventional, is that any time that a prophet is having a visionary experience, um, even though actions and behaviors and experiences are described um, uh, as an adjunct to that vision, they are all of those things are taking place as part of the vision. And that's really what, um, what the Ram is going to point out to us using some very, very specific examples, which he feels will be able to prove his point. So I'm going to share the handout for you uh, for today, which uh, which we've entitled "Prophecy Transcends Time and Space." Um, uh, as as a part of this, um, uh, we're going to discuss a couple of really um, hopefully really interesting things. The first thing that the Rambam starts with is basically what we would call a rule of induction. You know, there's deduction that you go from um, a general idea to a specific, and then there's induction, where you notice something in a specific case, and you can extrapolate that and say that that really applies to all of the things of the same category. So he says, from a single form of the communications of the prophets, an inference can be drawn to all of the communications belonging to that species. And so the Rambam's main thesis of this is that living experiences in time and space are grasped by the prophetic imagination and feel as if the prophet is experiencing experiencing them in real life when in reality he is not. Um, and we'll just uh, we'll just uh, read the first paragraph on page four hundred four in the Pines edition to drive that home. He says, after this introduction about my in, the, my point about induction, if I can show you one specific case of a prophetic experience where everything is happening in the mind, you can apply that to everything else, to all other cases. You should know that just as a man sees while sleeping that he has made a journey to a certain country, has married there, has stayed there for a certain time, that a son was born to him there, that he called him by a certain name, and that his son's circumstances and state were such and such. So in the case of prophetic parables seen or enacted in a vision of prophecy, when the parable requires a certain action, when things are done by the prophet, when intervals of time are mentioned within the parable between the various actions and the transportation from one place to another, this takes place only in a vision of prophecy. That is, just like you and I may have a dream 
that we may have spent weeks upon weeks or months upon months um, uh, in a certain place and done certain things, married and had children, et cetera, et cetera. And then we wake up and it was all a dream. This, the same thing takes place in a prophecy. They are not real actions, actions that exist for the external senses. And as a corollary of that, the Rambam harkens back to something that he had mentioned back in chapter 41 of this section, that a prophet may say, the Lord said to me, without saying it wasn't a dream, but we know that it happened in a dream state. In other words, there are many statements that we will find in Tanakh that imply that something was happening in the real physical world, but in reality, they were still part of the prophecy. Um, and then the Rambam says, I'm going to, using this principle of induction, give you one example from the book of Ezekiel chapter 8, and you'll be able to use this one example to, uh, to apply to all other similar scenarios. Um, so the, the, the story in Ezekiel chapter 8 is that it says, Vatipol alai sham yad Hashem elokim, that the hand of God fell upon me, which is a way of saying that he's having a prophetic experience. And he says, and I had a vision. And I see a being, some kind of celestial being that is of pure fire from his loins downwards. And from his loins upwards, he has the fear, the vision of chashmal, of some kind of flashing lightning or electricity. And then in verse 3, it says, Vaishlach tavnit yad, vayikacheni bitzitzit roshi, and this being sends forth his hand and picks me up by the corners of my head. Vatisa oti ruach, bein haaretz uvein hashamayim, and he lifts me up between the, the, in a wind, between the earth and the heavens. Vatave oti yerushalayma, and he brings me to Jerusalem, Bimar ot Elokim in the in this vision of God, El petach shar ha safona to the opening of the inner gate that is facing north, Asher sham Moshav Semel Hakina Hamakne, where there was situated a certain kind of idolatry, and the purpose of this whole prophecy, this whole prophetic uh, uh, vision that Yecheskel is ha is having in in Ezekiel chapter eight is to drive home to the prophet that what is taking place even in the inner chambers of the temple is corruption, that the people have turned towards idolatry and have even brought idolatry into the temple. And it is obvious to the Rambam that Ezekiel is having this in a visionary experience. It's obvious that he's not being lifted by a wind between heaven and earth and being, and being whisked to Jerusalem, to Jerusalem all of a sudden from where he was in Bavel. Um, and therefore, the same is true, he says, once we've established it in Ezekiel chapter 8, the same is true for a passage in Ezekiel chapter 3, where God says, it says, Vatihi alai sham yad Hashem, the hand of God is upon me once again. Vayomer elai, and he says to me, kum tzeil habika v'sham adaber otach, go to the plain, and I will speak to you there. Va'akum va'etzeil habika v'hinei sham kvod Hashem omeid, and I went out to the plain, and I see the glory of God was there, just like had, I had seen him in the in the Kavar River, and I fell on my, on my face. And this is no different, says the Rambam, from what we learned about Avraham, which we've seen in previous chapters in the Brit Ben Habitarim, the covenant of the two of the of the cut pieces. The Torah says in the middle of Avraham's vision, after the Torah has already established that he's having a vision of God, it says, Vayotze oto hachutza, that God takes him outside. So, and he says, look up at the stars and see if you can count them. The point being that the Rambam is making is that the prophet is having a, prof a prophecy of himself moving through time and space within this visionary experience. He's going from one place to another. He's going from inside to outside. He's going from down on the ground up into up to the heavens. He's going from Babylonia to Jerusalem, etc. And of course, he says, the entire vision of the dry bones was in that category as well. This is from Ezekiel chapter 37. And um, it is, it is uh, quite timely because we think about messianic ideas around 
the seasons of Passover and Sukkot, the Shalosh Regalim, and it says, Hayita Allah Yad Hashem, that the hand of God was upon me again. Vayotzi'eni Veruach Hashem, and God took me, caused me to, he transported me with a wind of God. Vayanicheni, Vayanicheni Betoch and placed me in the valley or on the plain. Vihi Malei'a Atzamot, and it was filled with bones. And the Rambam says clearly this vision that um, Ezekiel is having of the bones being resurrected, coming back to life, growing flesh and sinew and skin once again over these dry bones, that is all part of just a visionary experience. And it is a metaphor for the resurrection and the rejuvenation of the Jewish nation that will take place in the Second Temple. Now, I want to point out that as, as convinced as, as much as the Rambam has this conviction that this story takes place in a visionary experience and did not take place in the real world, that is not the opinion of some of the rabbis in the Talmud. This is from Sanhedrin, page Tzadi Bet, page 92b. There's a dispute among the sages whether the dry bones actually existed in the outside world. Rabbi Eliezer Omer, Meitim shehecheya yechezkel amdu al raglehem, Ve'amru shira vametu. Rabbi Eliezer is of the opinion that the dry bones that Ezekiel resurrected stood up on their feet, sang a song to God, and then they died. Clearly, he is arguing that they truly existed in the physical world. Mashi, and then the, the, the Gemara says, what song did they sing, etc. Then we have, then we say, Rabbi Huda Omer, emet mashal haya. In truth, this was all just a metaphor. It didn't exist in the real world. And that's what he means to say, be'emet mashol haya. In truth, even though it seemed like it was happening in real time in the real world, it was really only a metaphor as part of a visionary experience. Certainly, the Rambam can sort of hang his hat on the sage Rebbe Yehuda, but it's important to note that not all the sages believe this, and especially this next opinion of Rabbi Eliezer Beno Shel Rabbi Yossi HaGalili Omer, this third sage says, Meitim shehechaya yechezkel alu la'eretz Yisrael, the dead that Ezekiel resurrected made aliyah to Israel. V'nasu'u nashim, they married wives. V'holidu banim uvanot, and they they started families, they had children. Ahmad Reb Yehuda ben Beteral Raglavi Amar, and now a fourth sage to corroborate the statement of this of the third sage says he stood up and he made a dramatic declaration. He said, "Ani mibnei b'neihem, I am a descendant from one of those skeletons that was resurrected and got married and had children." V'halalut filin shehiniachli avi abba mehem. And my grandfather gave me this pair of tefillin that I'm wearing that came from one of those resurrected individuals. Now, this is, of course, very dramatic. And so just looking at the simple understanding of the text of this Gemara, you see that a whole host of sages disagree with the Rambam. But the, that doesn't deter the Rambam from his position. This visionary experience, we know that the Rambam is a miracle minimalist. And therefore, whenever he sees the potential for the for a miracle to not be taking place in the real world in real time, he will interpret it that way. Now, now that he's taught us that being transported from one place to another and seeing things that are happening in one place and another are all happening in a vision, the Rambam goes on to the next point, which is even when the prophet is told to do something, and he performs an action in a prophecy, that too is part of the visionary dream, such as the continuation of Ezekiel's vision in chapter eight, which we started with, where he is instructed to bore a hole in the wall of the temple. And there too, God tells to Ezekiel, after he sees the idolatry uh, behind the gate of the temple, God tells him in his vision, I want you to bore a hole through the wall that's in front of you, and he bores a hole and he discovers even more idolatry and more abominable things that are being done in the confines of the temple. Here too, it's not that Ezekiel literally bored a hole in the wall of the temple, 
um, but rather this is all part of the visionary experience. And then the Rambam writes, the same is true for actions that were the prophet to do them publicly would make him a laughingstock. And as he says, and we quote from the text, God is too exalted that he should turn his prophets into laughingstock and a mockery for fools by ordering them to carry out crazy actions. And therefore, another section in Ezekiel must also be visionary because it's unlikely that God would have a prophet carry out something that would just seem bizarre to the onlooker. And this is from Ezekiel chapter 4, uh, all of chapter 4 and the beginning of chapter 5. I'll just point out the salient points because otherwise it'll take us too long to go through the entire text. The first thing that God tells Ezekiel in, in the beginning of chapter 4 is to take a large brick and to uh, engrave upon it an engraving of the city of Jerusalem. And then to sort of almost like uh, a child would do. Okay, I hope I hope people can still hear me. It said for some reason that my that I had been muted, but it doesn't appear it does not appear that I am muted anymore. Okay. So I'm going to sh- let me share my screen again. Okay, and we will continue. So the next part of Ezekiel chapter 4 is that God tells me to sleep now on my right side for a full 40 days, representing the 40 years of sin of another section of where in, in the, the Jews of the, of the Judean part of Eretz Israel. And then God tells me to bind myself with ropes to prevent myself from being able to turn over, uh, you know, what, while I'm in this, while I'm sleeping on my right side and on my left side. And then in verse number nine, it says, God tells me to take a bunch of different grains made out of wheat and out of barley and beans and uh, and lentils and millet and uh, and spelt and put it all into one container and um, and um, and make it into a bread um, that it should stay with me uh, for the 390 days that I'm sleeping on my left side um, and and then. I should bake this dough on human dung. In other words, a fire that is burning from human dung. All of this sounds very, very bizarre. And what the Rambam is basically saying is that it's unlikely that God would want the prophet to do this in real life. It just becomes too outlandish at one point. And at at the beginning of verse 5, God says, V'ata ben adam kach lecha cherev chada tar hagalavim God says, take a very sharp razor, and I want you to shave off all of the hair on your head, 
all of the hair on your beard with this razor. I want you to divide all of the hair into two parts and put it on a scale, et cetera, et cetera. That's, that's the beginning of the prophecy. So not only does the Rambam say that it's unlikely that God would ask a prophet to perform an act that would make him a laughing stock, such as the behaviors in, in chapter four, God would also never tell a prophet to perform an act that is forbidden by the Torah, such as cutting one's beard and head corners if it's only to transmit a symbolic message. The Torah does prohibit a person, a man, from shaving off his peyote, the corners of his of his uh, of his head and the corners of his face so you're not allowed to apply a razor either to your payas or to your beard why would god actually tell ezekiel to do that if it's only to provide him with a message so therefore the conclusion is based on the fact that god would not tell a prophet to do something that would make him look foolish and would not tell him to do something that is prohibited it must be that these actions that are being described took place in a vision and did not take place in, in the real world. As a matter of fact, the Rambam even says that for Ezekiel, it would have been a double uh, uh, prohibition because Ezekiel not only was a regular Jew, he was a Kohen. This causes some of the commentaries to be troubled by the, the statement of the Rambam that because he was a Kohen, there would have been a double infraction were he to shave his beard and peyote with a razor. Um, and Rav Kafich discusses this idea. The Rambam is speaking homiletically. He's not speaking halachically over here because halachically there is no greater prohibition for a Kohen to shave his, his beard and hair than there is for a Yisrael, for a regular Jew. But because the Torah emphasizes it again in, the, in Parshat Emor for the Kohanim, um, he says that it is doubly problematic for a Kohen to do that. Similarly, Isaiah never actually walked naked and barefoot, which would also be something both outlandish and halachically prohibited for a person to expose themselves publicly, as is implied in Isaiah chapter 20, verse 3. And the Rambam therefore says, and we quote, only those weak in syllogistic reasoning fancy with regard to all this that the prophet tells that he was ordered to do certain things and hence did them. In, real, in the real physical world. It's simply illogical to conclude that. Ezekiel also relates that he was ordered while still in Babylon to dig into the wall on the Temple Mount. But because scripture explicitly states that he was in the midst of a vision, it is clear that he didn't do this activity in real life. Similarly, scripture relates that in the middle, middle of Avraham's vision, that God took him outside and told him to count the stars, this too was part of the prophetic vision. And the Rambam just points these out because he's saying that the text itself states that he was in the middle of a prophetic vision. And if the text itself is stating that he's in the middle of a vision, you can't then mix and match and suggest that something was taking place on a physical plane. The same can be said of Jeremiah's prophecy of hiding a linen belt in the Euphrates River, causing it to rot. God told him, uh, God told Jeremiah in chapter 13, to take to make himself a belt that was made out of flax, out of linen, um, and then to to hide it and to put it and to to wear it and get it all sweaty, and then to put it in the Euphrates River, also causing it corrosion because water will destroy anything that's made out of linen if left in it for a long enough time. This all must have been a vision since Jeremiah never left the land of Israel and never saw the Euphrates River. And that's what he does in quoting all of this. The, um, the Radak in his commentary to Jeremiah chapter 13 actually makes a point of saying that he's uncertain whether this uh, whole uh, commandment to Jeremiah to take a linen belt and put it in the Euphrates River actually happened. He says, Inyan ha'ezor, efshar shahaya mamash, the asa ken yirmiyahu mashetzi vahu hakel. He says it is possible that it took place in the real world. He's not convinced that the Rambam is correct. He says, Rambam katav ki shel haya kol He says the, the great Rambam, the, the arbiter of, of truth, uh, states that this was all done in a visionary experience. 
Now, the, probably the most startling example that the Rambam gives of something that was done in a dream is the entire story of Hosea, Hosea the prophet, starting with chapter one, where God commands him that he take a licentious woman as a wife and bear children with her. And the Rambam writes that this too was all part of a visionary experience. In other words, the prophet Hosea dreams that he is spending literally years with a woman who does not even exist and that he has children with her. And this is all taking place perhaps in the confines of just a few minutes or even a few seconds of a prophetic experience. When he wakes up, he believes that he's lived through years of living with, the, with this wife, having several children with her, giving those children names, developing a bond and an attachment, a relationship with these people. And then when God tells him to divorce his wife and send away his children, he says he cannot. And God says to him, well, in the same way, even though the Jewish people have become a bad licentious people, I cannot simply send them away. And the Rambam says, after it has been stated expressly that these were parables, there remains no room for obscurity as to any of these things having a real existence, except for those about whom it is said that, that they look at um, prophecy and they don't understand it correctly. The Rambam quotes a passage in Isaiah chapter 29 that says that some people look at a prophetic depiction and it's a closed book for them, i.e. only for someone who doesn't wish to read the prophecy correctly, for he hasn't taken the proper effort to focus on the prophet prophecy, and it is therefore a closed book to him. But for everyone else who reads the passage with discrimination and with a certain amount of discernment, they will be able to determine that even that entire story of Hosea taking a wife and bearing children is all part of a visionary experience. I immediately thought of something from many years ago that I had seen an episode of Star Trek The Next Generation. I hope you'll forgive me, but I have the source here that's it's considered to be by many people uh, the best episode of that entire series, Star Trek The Next Generation. And it's a story of Jean-Luc Picard, the captain of the Enterprise, who is uh, who has this um, sentience that is implanted in his mind, wherein he thinks he's come to a planet, marries a wife, has children, grows old, and then at the end of literally 40 years of this existence, wakes up and is told that it's all been a dream. So if you want to see actually a, a, a dramatic depiction of this concept, you can take a look at that. The Rambam, can, I'm sorry for if that if anyone found that to be frivolous, I just found that to be a very vivid illustration of exactly what the Rambam is describing in this chapter. This, uh, the, the next thing the Rambam writes is the story of Gid'on and the fleece that he asks God for a sign, prove to me, God, that you have sent me and that you want me to go out and lead the Jewish people. He says, and this is all from, chap from the book of Judges, chapter 6, it also only occurred in a vision. There are many miraculous things that are depicted in Judges chapter 6 that uh, the, the, the leader Gidon experiences, um, and he, but Gidon asks for two signs. The first sign he asks for is, God, he says, I'm going to go to sleep, and I want there to, I'm going to put down a, um, a, 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 a wad or a ball of wool, and, um, and um, I'm going to leave it here where I fall asleep in the threshing barn. If in the morning it is moist and all of the surrounding ground area is dry, then that's a sign of that you've done a miracle. He wakes up in the morning, picks up the ball of wool, and lo and behold, it is saturated with water uh, uh, amidst a completely arid and dry ground. Then the next night he says, God, show me another miracle. And uh, if I wake up in the morning and there's a new ball of wool that is completely dry and everywhere else around it is moist, then that's a sign that you have sent me. And lo and behold, so it was. The Rambam writes that all of this is not happening in the physical world. It's happening as part of a visionary experience. And the Rambam proves this by saying, and we learned this in a previous chapter, that Gidon himself was not a true prophet. Certainly then he could not perform a miracle or have one performed for him in real life. 
It could be, you could argue, well, maybe if he was really, truly a Navi, a prophet, then God would perform a miracle. But he's not even that. This further proves that it was a vision, not a real life experience. And as the Rambam writes, Gideon was not considered to be a very important person. The Gemara in Rosh Hashanah 25b says he was Kal Shebe Kalim, that he was in the category of people who were considered to be not heavyweights, but really he was a lightweight of a person as far as his spiritual engagement with God. He did not achieve true, pro true prophecy. His vision was akin to the visions in a dream of night of that of Lavan and Avimelech that we explained before in chapter 42. And then the Rambam writes, and I think this is his final illustration, the story of the prophet Zechariah from chapter 11 of the book of Zechariah, where it says that he was appointed by God to be in charge of, of cattle or sheep that were meant to go for the slaughter. In other words, they were relegated for a, a, for a terrible fate, and he was supposed to be watching over them. And he uses two staffs, and each staff has a name, and he's guiding the sheep, and he's still not successful in making sure that they are well protected. And then it says that eventually he breaks each one of the sticks, one that was called Noam, and, uh, and, uh, and the other one was called Chovalim, describing the two different ways in which God guides the Jewish people through Jewish history, one in a pleasant way, one in a, des a destructive, painful way. And then he is asked, he asks the people that, that, he is, uh, um, that are the owners of the sheep after having shepherded them for a certain period of time, he says, pay me my wages. And they pay him these 30 pieces of silver. And then God tells him, Throw the throw the thirty pieces of silver into a uh, into a chest uh, so that you can preserve this silver, and this is all, of course, a metaphor for the fact that the Jews are like the, the uh, sheep that are being taken to the slaughter. They're going to experience great destruction, but nonetheless, because they are still being guided, but in a destructive way, there will be money put aside for them to build the second temple. This is a thing that can only be doubted or not known by him who confuses the possible things with the impossible ones. What the Rambam is basically saying, anyone who believes that this took place in the real world is someone who's just very, very confused. And that's the last example that the Rambam gives. And the conclusion of his last paragraph is, anything that is a parable for a future event took place in a vision. And the Rambam's point is this, why would God go through such an elaborate um, um, process of having the prophet go through a real life experience that could potentially even involve a miracle and have him perform many laborious acts in real life, in real time, if it's only to provide a metaphor for something that's going to happen in the future? If the whole function of it is metaphorical to portend something that's going to happen in the future, why do you need for this to be anything other than a thought, an illustration in the imagination of the prophet? That's the thesis. And it's on that basis that the Rambam says that all of the examples that I presented to you, and so many more that you will find in Tanakh, happen only on, on a mental plane, do not happen on a physical plane. Now, I just want to conclude our discussion today with pointing out something, uh, which is that I believe that Nachmanides will not agree with the Rambam. If the Rambam's argument is that there's no point in having these things take place in a, on a physical plane because they're only metaphors of, of something that's going to happen in the future, um, the, Ramban, the Ramban, Nachmanides, disagrees with that principle. He feels that there is relevance in having things take place uh, on a physical plane, even if they're only metaphorical messages. The Ramban is of the opinion, and he says this in his commentary to the, in the beginning of Parshat Lech Lecha, on Genesis chapter 12, verse 6, he says there is real benefit for a prophet to what he calls an actualization of a prophecy. To actualize a prophecy by doing a physical act in the physical world that gives sort of life or substance to a future event which needs to be triggered by having someone do something in the real world. 
And uh, just I'll just read a few lines from the Ramban. He says, Omar lecha klal tavin oto bechol parshiot habaot. He says, I'm going to tell you a general rule, and you can apply this general rule to all of the stories that you're going to find in Genesis, the inyan Avraham, Yitzchak, the Yaakov, in the lives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Vuhu inyan gadol. It's a very important principle. He's kiruhu rabotenu bederech kitsara. Our sages make small allusion to it. Va'amru kol ma she'ira le'avot siman le'banim. They say that in the language of the Tanchum and Medrash, that anything that happened to our patriarchs is a portent, a portent for their children. And what the way the way the Ramban understands that statement is that when they act in certain ways in their lives, that gives substance and actualization to future events that will happen to their descendants. Vilachain Yaarihu Hakituvim Bisipor Hamasaot. And it is for that reason that scripture will go into great detail, telling us where Abraham traveled, for example, or where Yaakov traveled, or how Yitzchak dug wells, and all other episodes that occur in the lives of the patriarchs. A person reading some of these stories, some of these narratives in, in scripture may think that these are just frivolous stories that serve no purpose. But but all of these stories are actually lessons to teach about the future. Because when something happens to one of the three patriarchs who themselves were prophets, then he will contemplate on it and recognize that the same will happen to his descendants. And he says, as a continuation of this, He says, when God issues a divine decree, and he wants it to become something that is well embedded in reality, he will make sure that someone does a physical action to actualize and give rise and give life to that decree to make sure that it is an irrevocable decree. That is to say that according to the Ramban, when a prophet has a prophecy that is accompanied with a physical action, then that prophetic portent is irrevocable. When the action, when when the prophecy is not accompanied by an action, then it is tenuous whether or not the prophecy will come to be in the future. And that is the reason why God has his prophets perform specific acts in order to create an irrevocable um, permanence to that decree that God is making in the prophecy. This is a challenge to the Rambam's whole thesis in this chapter and in prior chapters. According to the Rambam, there's no rhyme or reason why a prophet should have to go through the uh, th through the um, bother of doing all of these actions that are described in Scripture if they're all metaphorical allusions to the future. But in reality, according to the Ramban, there is every reason to go through the motions in the physical world so that whatever decree is taking place, whatever portent is taking place in the prophecy will Will be given permanence and a sense of that this is definitely going to happen in the future because an action accompanied it in the physical world. So you've transferred the physical act, you've transferred um, the uh, the visionary experience into the physical plane. What? Yes. Okay. We're going to hold it here for today, and um, I hope. Uh, I'm sorry, I have to what? mute you. We're going to hold it for today, everybody, and um, I hope you have a good week. We will not be studying next week because I'll be traveling again. And so we're going to have one more class between now and Pesach. I'm going to try to uh, uh, combine, if I can, I'll try to combine chapters 47 and 48 so that we conclude section two before Passover. Um, I, I'm going to try. I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to do it, but we'll see you, Bezrat Hashem, in two weeks from today. Thank you. Bye-bye.